uh, alive? Are we going? We're live, Larry. Okay, so thank you. We're muted, Larry. I, yeah, I thought maybe I just dropped off. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Gray Water Showcase. Um, this event is co-hosted by Waterwise Davis and Tree Davis. Waterwise Davis is a working group of Cool Davis. To begin the showcase, we would like to start with a land acknowledgement by Francis Andrews. Go ahead, Francis. Thank you, Larry, and welcome everyone. Although I guess the land of knowledge, it's not by me, it's, uh, but I am reading it. Um, so um, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all this evening and an honor to share this acknowledgement of the land that nurtures us. It feels particularly relevant this evening uh, for this conversation that we're having. So I invite you to put aside your phone and other distractions, take a deep breath and settle your feet on the ground or as close as you can get to it um, as we get started. As we begin, we'd like to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Putwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putwin tribes, Kachil Dihi Band of Wintoon Indians of the Calusa Indian community, Kletzel Dihi Wintoon Nation, and Yocha Dihi Wintoon Nation. The Putwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. Thank you all, and I hope you enjoy and learn much from today's conversation. All right, thank you, Francis. Um, also, I am Larry Gunther, and I will be your host this evening. I'm a board member of Tree Davis, a member of the Davis Tree Commission, uh, among a lot of other community actions. Tree Davis is a great organization and I am proud that Tree Davis is co-hosting this event with Cool Davis, another great davisbase.org. Um, so a bit of information, this webinar is being recorded for a future reference and we will have three speakers with a short Q&A after each focused, uh, after each talk focused on their presentation and then a longer more general Q&A at the end. Um, and also at the end, we will raffle off a Greywater hardware package. So please stay tuned. Um, so we'd like to discuss some roles and norms uh, for this event. So please make space and take space. We wanna hear your voice, but we wanna hear all the voices. Um, please put your questions into the Q&A. We will be monitoring chat, but there's a lot to monitor. So please put questions in the Q&A. If you need tech support, uh, you can chat directly with Chrissy Backman, who is doing all our online stuff um, and doing an amazing job. Um, Francis Andrews will be the Q&A moderator, and please use the chat during transitions and Q&A for supportive commentary. Um, in addition to our three speakers, I would like to welcome Brian Fenty, the new chief building official for Davis. He will be available for our longer uh, Q&A session at the end of the showcase. So just a little bit about Tree Davis. Why is Tree Davis involved in this event? Well, while we're getting warnings about water usage, we also want to maintain our tree canopy. And gray water will be a great tool to help keep our trees alive while saving water. Okay, so let's get started. Our first speaker is Don Calciano. Don is a City of Davis Conservation Coordinator in the Environmental Resources Division. Her primary focus is water conservation. And prior to working for the City of Davis, Don worked as a Water Conservation Coordinator for the City of Woodland. Um, Don will speak about the status of drought, uh, water resources, and water conservation in Davis. So let's give a welcome to Don Calciano. Let me share my screen here. Thank you, Larry. And uh, thank you to Waterwise Davis and Tree Davis for inviting me to speak here tonight. 
Okay. Okay. Go ahead and get started. So as Larry mentioned, I'm a, one of uh, two conservation coordinators with the city of Davis. I focus on uh, water conservation. And provide some updates kind of on city water supplies in general and um, water conservation efforts. The um, 2020 water quality report is now available online. I know we've had some questions regarding uh, water quality recently with uh, the operation of our uh, deep water aquifer wells more, in, um, which is a conjunctive use system with our um, surface water, and I'll go into that a little bit more. But that 2020 water quality report is available online, and as in past years, the sea drinking water does meet all state and federal drinking water standards. Uh, we have seen water usage in April and May of 2021 increase in comparison to 2019 and 2020. Primarily, we're seeing, we believe, a shift in irrigation use with two dry years of people turning on um, irrigation systems in April as compared to maybe May in past years. Uh, we also know, uh, realize that there's increased indoor water use, people who are work, working remotely still, um, you know, obviously additional hand washing and sanitation needed due to the uh, COVID pandemic. So we know we have our current uh, dry year conditions. We're in the second uh, dry year. Uh, we turn 91, which is the curtailment of surface water supplies in order to uh, protect environmental water for the Delta, um, went into effect on April 30th of 2021. This means that there's less surface water that can be diverted by the Woodland Davis Clean Water Agency that supplies water to you. Uh, the surface water, Sacramento River water, to the cities of Woodland and Davis, and um, a smaller amount to UC Davis. This often happens in the summer months, the cur ter um, 91 curtailments, they did go into effect a little earlier this year, and they may last longer into the fall or winter than they typically have in the past. Uh, during the summer, the city relies more heavily on groundwater supplies. We do have a conjunctive use system of groundwater and surface water, and the groundwater that's used is primarily from the deep aquifer wells, which have similar water quality to the surface water. Uh, we do occasionally run the intermediate wells. It's usually for well testing and just to operate them, um, or in certain peak times of day when we need water use for a particular area of town. Um, in the uh, picture that you see here, it shows our uh, water usage for May of 2021, that 59% was groundwater, 41% was Sacramento River water. Typically, we see the inverse of that even in the summertime, where it's more of 60% river water and 40% groundwater. So we are in a drier year this year. Uh, conservation update, just kind of generally where we're at with Davis with conservation. Uh, the city's water production was 15% less in 2020 than 2013, which is still the state baseline year that was used during the last drought. Uh, the city has surpassed our 20% by 2020 gallons per capita day uh, target, which was 172. Uh, the city's GPCD for 2020, even with COVID and having a dry year, was 132, which also surpassed the Natural Resource Commission goal of 134 gallons per capita day. Uh, so although we know that weather patterns can change, we're seeing that we have more dry year, consecutive dry years in a row and then some very wet years, uh, we're really looking at long-term efficiency and how do we balance water use efficiency along with stormwater and flooding you know, components. So the uh, City of Davis, the Water Conservation Tracker Graph, which is available on our website at savedaviswater.org. You can see here in April, we saw a pretty significant increase compared to the past two years. In May, we've closed that gap some, and in June, it was only about a two and a half percent difference between 2020 and 2021. If you're not already familiar with Aquahawk, I want to introduce Aquahawk. It's the city's online customer water use portal. It gives our customers the ability to set usage alerts. That's one of the primary benefits of this portal. You can view daily and hourly water use for your property. And the hope is that that enables all of us to be able to spot and repairs um, repair leaks as quickly as possible. You can also look at that hourly information to see, you know, how much water does my irrigation use when it runs? How much does my dishwasher use? To kind of get an idea of overall water use for your property. There are currently over 6,200 users registered in Aquahawk. 
you um, likely have heard because there's been a lot of information about the drought that there's a statewide um, call for a 15% voluntary reduction in water use. Um, and that's a 15% you know, statewide um, reduction, not for each individual you know, municipality or homeowner. Um, on July 8th, the governor called for the voluntary 15% reduction compared to 2020 levels. In that same um, executive order, it did recognize the efforts that um, Californians had made during the 2012 to 2016 drought. And we definitely saw a lot of those um, efforts from the water customers here in Davis making long-term changes to their water use patterns, um, doing turf conversions, um, kind of modifying the way that water is used in town. Uh, local water suppliers and communities have also taken steps to improve um, supplies and in, um, make sure that we have drought resilience. And we've seen that we have a surface water and a groundwater supply. We have a conjunctive use system um, to hopefully be able to balance, um, you know, the water needs, water quality, um, all of those different aspects that go into water production. So um, actions mentioned in the executive order, uh, just to kind of go through those quickly, is um, making sure that landscapes are irrigated efficiently, uh, running washers and dishwashers only when they're full, finding and fixing leaks as quickly as possible, attempting to keep showers under five minutes, using shut off um, nozzles on hoses, and taking cars to commercial car washes that recycle their water. So water supplies during um, dry years and drought, the city has added uh, two web pages or uh, two pages to our website, one on water supplies during dry years and drought and another on drought information and water use restrictions. And we are um, updating those. We've recently updated actually the water tracker for June. We're providing you know, additional information as it becomes available about um, anything that's happening at the, the state level and locally as it pertains to water usage and drought conditions. Um, included on those pages, our information on um, making trees a priority. And that's the focus of uh, the spray water workshop tonight. Uh, there were definitely lessons learned from the last drought statewide. There was a lot of messaging about, um, you know, brown is the new green or gold is the new green and um, people turning off irrigation systems, not uh, necessarily realizing that they still needed to deep water their trees. Um, so making trees a priority, um, we've had, um, information on social media in our e-blast, which is through our Greener Davis, um, Facebook and Instagram, um, press releases um, in the newspaper on our website. We have, um, these are just some samples uh, showing our website with information on protecting your trees and then also um, an article from our June e-blast on prioritizing and protecting trees. And then a couple of our social media posts. Um, and then I've also noticed, I've seen that Cole Davis, Tree Davis, Poudre Creek Council, a number of nonprofits have had um, information about drought out there. And uh, kind of we're all sending that message out to our customers, um, you know, to our the, the people here in town who are already conservation minded, but they're getting that message, um, you know, about prioritizing trees, I think, for multiple places. There are new uh, water use efficiency standards at the state level. It was uh, Senate Bill 606 and Assembly Bill 1668 that um, is basically replacing that 20% by 2020. Now that we're past 2020, uh, there's new efficiency standards. They are not yet uh, finalized. There's still a lot of unknowns with those standards, but the general idea is that each uh, urban retail water agency will have a water use objective, which will include indoor use, outdoor residential use, um, commercial, industrial, institutional landscape use, and water loss. So the State Water Board is set to um, adopt these standards by June 30th of 2020, and then water agencies would calculate and report on their water use objectives beginning in November of 2023. There's still many details for each component of the water use objective that are unknown and should be determined over the course of 2021. Now I'll turn things back over to Larry. Great, thank you, Don. I guess I'm having trouble starting, unable to start video, um, but you don't need to see. Um, yeah, one of the first things I remember learning uh, as a native Californian is that the hills are not brown, they are golden. So uh, <laughs> Francis will get a few questions from the Q&A for Don. Go ahead. Okay. 
Yes, thank you. Don, we do have a couple of questions from Johan. His first question is, how much of the intake water is returned from the wastewater treatment plants to the Sacramento River over the year? So that's dependent on our NPDES permit, which I believe was recently updated. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but we do have a um, recycled water report that was done, a study, and I believe that information would be in that report, which should be available on our website. Great. Thank you, um, Don. And Johan also asked, um, water reduction needs a clear numerical reference. Why don't we use the minimum water requirement on a monthly basis for a household that should conveniently satisfy that minimum need to get around with over the year? Hmm, is that clear? So we have, um, I'm not sure if this is exactly his question, but we do have on the utility bill, the single family residential average for each month. So unfortunately like your August bill is your June water use. So it'll show the average for June use. And it um, really in the summertime, water usage is very dependent on lot size and the amount of the irrigation you have. So even if you have drip irrigation, but a very large lot and you're using it efficiently, it may use more water than a sprinkler system on a much smaller lot. Um, so we do tend to see that about, um, it's like 50 to 65% of water usage in the summer is outdoors. So a lot of our messaging is information on reducing water use outdoors, making sure that um, we found that many people are doing exactly what we asked and they are uh, irrigating at night. But because of that, you don't always know that there's an issue with your irrigation system. So we remind people to turn their irrigation off occasionally during the day, just for a few minutes to check out that everything is working properly. You know, rodents haven't chewed through drip lines, um, that sprinklers aren't, you know, spraying onto the driveway, that nothing's kind of come loose or come apart within the system. And also use Aquahawk to check for continuous water use. Um, so looking in there, people see water usage throughout the night in hourly water use. You expect to see some hours of zero use for single family properties. If they're seeing continuous use, then there may be an issue and toilets and irrigation are the two biggest issues we see. Great. Thank you, Dawn. That, and and um, Johan, I do want to say at the end, you can ask more questions. And if, if any of these need more clarification, any of you that you will have an opportunity to actually come on yourself mm -hmm. and, and have more clarification. Johan did ask, since we do have time, he had one other um, question, which was, why not show the people a chart of Aquahawk so that people directly can see leakage? And you were kind of talking about that, but mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, so um, any water customer in, in Davis, it's, Fortunately, at, at this time, it's for property owners, but um, renters, you can't have multiple people registered for an account. So I encourage renters to ask the property owners to have access to Aquahawk. Um, and if they've given, you know, the account number and the information in order to register, then you can have, you know, you could have your landscaper. If you have a landscaper or gardener, you can have them registered. Um, when you look in Aquahawk, you see the usage for your individual property. And so then you're able to look at usage patterns. There is about a 12 hour delay, but that's a lot sooner than getting, you know, the two months after on your bill. So, you know, if your water usage today, you should be able to see by tomorrow evening in Aquahawk. Oh, great. Thank you. So you can have other people other than the owner. Um, can yeah, you can have as many people's registered. They can see that there's other people registered, but they can't see their contact information. Um, and so it is, you you know, um, that was a, had been a request actually from some property owners um, so that they could have additional people registered without necessarily sharing all of their information on there. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I love Aquahawk. <laughs> And that is all the um, questions that um, we have in the Q&A right now. Great. Great. Thank you so uh, much, Don. Yeah, thank you, Don, and thank you, Francis. I love doing webinars in a university town. The questions are always awesome. Um, I'm really happy to introduce our next speaker, who is Don Shore. Uh, Don is a renowned plant expert, UC Davis alum, and the owner of the Redwood Barn Nursery in Davis. He hosts the Dav Davis Garden Show on Cater 95.7. He also hosts Jazz After Dark. Uh, he is a lifetime gardener, raising almonds, pecans, walnuts, and mandarins on 13 acres in Solano County. A uh, large family orchard and vegetable garden. Don also currently serves with me on the Tree Davis Board. 
And Don is going to speak about meeting tree watering needs with gray water. So let's welcome Don Shore. Hi, Don. Thank you, and I hope I've done everything correct here. I'm about to try and share my screen and we'll see if that works. And there we go. And I'm a member of the board of Tree Davis and I first inter, uh, experienced or interacted with gray water in the early 1980s when we had just gone through a profound drought here in Northern California, whole state of California. Things were a little different back then. Uh, people were installing gray water systems themselves and they were coming into my garden center and saying, where should I put this outflow? Should I just put it on these trees? Should I put it in my vegetable garden? Should I put it on the young tree I've just planted? What's the, what are the parameters? And then as now, the concerns are the same, the opportunities are greater, and a big difference is that now you have professionals to install these. There's actually building codes with regard to how they're supposed to be installed, at least I believe. And we know a lot more about the plant materials that may be successful near or with gray water and those that might be a problem. And so I will say first positive that it can definitely augment our watering of established shrubs and trees. It's not going to be enough specifically for any individual tree, but it can put out there and get into the root zone of established trees. And going back to the first comment that was made, we all want to prioritize trees during the drought. So that's one obvious use for them. Tree Davis is out planting hundreds of trees in the community. I'm not, I'm just on the board, but our volunteers and our uh, arborists are, and they've planted several hundred trees. They're hand watering those trees through the first summer manually, but we do a fair number of them in individual residential landscapes. And we would really appreciate it if those folks would give them several gallons once a week or so uh, to help get them established. There's a lot of landscape species that are very appropriate for use of gray water. And what I wanna focus on a little bit today is the plants that can be a little more problematic that you should in either in a new design or a installation in an existing landscape as to how close the wet zone will be to those plants. And these are the key issues. It's considered wastewater, so it can't be stored. Uh, the water output is not based on what the plants need. It's based on when you take a shower or when you do laundry. And so the water output is intermittent, as I say on my notes, and variable. And it, real important is that some landscape species are very intolerant of having frequent irrigation near the crown. And I should note, almost everything I'm talking about with gray water is also an issue with drip irrigation, as many drip irrigation systems are installed as well. So those are the issues. Uh, but there are solutions to them. You can get the water to drain away from the crown of the individual plant. You simply make sure that it's elevated enough that water percolates away from a young tree or particularly a species of concern. You wanna make sure that water doesn't collect around the plant at any time. It, however, can be very useful to establish young trees in the landscape. I do wanna throw this in here. I'm a plant person, not an epidemiologist, but use of gray water needs to be safe. It needs to be safe not only for uh, the trees, but safe for people. And the primary concerns are E. coli and salmonella. So I'm just going to simply say, do not use gray water with low-lying vegetable plants or fruiting plants such as strawberries, leafy greens, vegetables, things like that, because of the possibility of contamination. Uh, you can talk to others who have greater expertise in what the real concern is there, but you want to keep it away from direct contact with edibles. However, your fruit and nut trees uh, may do very well with uh, the use of gray water. And you can certainly have uh, the outflow from your washing machine. It can provide water for a young fruit tree that you just planted, getting going, getting established. Uh, daily water is not optimal, but there's two basic types of gray water that others are going to talk about. And the gray water from your washing machine, which depends on your household, but maybe every few days would be very good for a young fruit tree. Every few days, getting several gallons of water could be a great way to get it going. Those of you living in the parts of town that have clay loam or clay-like soils, the denser soils need to give some special consideration to the fact that even a fairly small amount of gray water is gonna stay in that soil longer and you have a higher likelihood of retaining moisture around the crown of the plant, which can be an issue. So that is something of concern to those of you living if you're in the Davis area, Stonegate, Binning Tract, Coval Park, areas where the soils are just denser and higher in clay. The reason for all this concern is that we're trying to avoid root and crown rot. And these are disease problems uh, that can kill a tree 
a very common conversation, my staff at my garden center in town, seven or eight days after an extreme heat event and people are watering as they come in and they say, I planted 20 lavender plants and three of them just up and died over the last few days. That's root and crown rot. And it's a particular organi organism that causes it. We often will tell you, you overwatered it, but I wanna be precise, overwatering is a misleading term. My orchard can have standing water for 24 hours in the winter time and I won't have an issue. If I had 24 hours of standing water in July, I lose a significant percentage of my trees, not because of the water, but because of a particular pathogen. So watering so that the area at the interface of the crown and the soil, the stem, the trunk and the soil stays constantly wet is an invitation to crown and root rot infection. These are water molds, which are a fascinating group of organisms. And the picture I'm showing you here is what's happened to many of our native oak and tan bark oak over in the coastal areas since they become invaded by sudden oak death, a particular type of Phytophthora. That's not the one we're talking about here, but this shows you what can happen when a new organism in this genus invades an area. Tens of thousands of trees of particular species have been killed by Phytophthora ramorum in the coastal fog belt. And the Phytophthora organisms were the reason many Irish people are in America. They caused the potato, the late blight of potato that caused famine. And the particular one of concern for us is the crown and root rot Phytophthora cinnamomai, as the name implies. It was first identified on cinnamon plants. It is a unique organism in that it has spores that can swim kind of like little sperm. And they can swim on a film of water on a leaf. They can swim on the surface of a root. They can swim, and this is the unfortunate part, in free water in the soil. And the likeliest infection of Phytophthora cinnamomai occurs at high temperatures with high moisture status. Think about that. That's not something that normally happens in California. We would not ordinarily have high moisture status during 100 degree weather because it doesn't rain here in the summer. And again, the comment about dense soils, clay loam type soils, they retain moisture and increase susceptibility due to poor drainage. Irrigation frequency in summer is the most common factor in the environment that we would look at in dealing with a mitigating or preventing crown and root rot. And this is a problem for us in the landscape because many of the plants that we like now because of the earlier presentation, the Davis residents have cut their water use by a significant percentage. A lot of that has been plant selection, choosing plants from regions similar to ours that don't need as much water during the summertime. Well, unfortunately, plants from regions similar to ours are going to have a likelihood of susceptibility to Phytophthora. Plants that evolved in rainy summer regions are less likely to get Phytophthora. So these are key species in our xeric landscapes and unfortunately more vulnerable. Uh, it's interesting little note here for those of you that are into the science of this kind of thing. We have a plant in California called Madrone, Arbutus menziesii. The old joke about Madrone is that it only grows where Madrone grows. In other words, you simply can't grow it out of its native range because of its high susceptibility to these water molds, to the Phytophthora. A different species that's native to Ireland, which I think we can all agree is a rainy summer climate, has substances in the leaves that fall on the ground and suppress Phytophthora and suppress other organisms. So that particular species in the same genus has developed its own resistance to this organism that is so pathogenic to our native species in the, in the Arbutus genus. So that's the issue we're dealing with is a susceptibility of a lot of popular plants to this particular pathogen. There's best management practices that are very simple. The most common deals with how often you water, allow the surface to dry between waterings. If I could get everybody in Davis to water really thoroughly once a week, I would feel I've done my job. Uh, the issue I'm usually dealing with is shallow watering, daily basis, and then people coming in with problems of moisture around the crown. So you avoid prolonged moisture status around the crown. And unfortunately, the gray water could be a factor in that if it's not installed correctly. Woody plants, trees and shrubs should be up. When you get done planting them, they should be above grade a little bit. So water percolates away from the crown. I mentioned the drip system problem before, and unfortunately, gray water, if it were in, improperly installed, could lead to a similar problem. Daily watering, if you happen to shower every day or if you got a high laundry load in your household. I used to have teenagers living with me. You know, laundry was a daily thing. Happens less often now, but it's, inter, it, it's intermittent now. 
you need to allow the surface to dry a little bit between waterings. And then you just need to know which species are particularly susceptible and make sure the outflow is away from the crowns of woody plants in general and those plants in particular. And some of our California natives, some of what we call the, the high sales uh, type of natives in the nursery business are particularly vulnerable. Fremont adendron, flannel bush, beautiful plant, so susceptible that native plant enthusiasts regularly kill it off by irrigating incorrectly in the late spring and early summer. Ceanothus, one of the most popular California natives, which I would point out is not actually native here. Uh, mostly the Ceanothus are native to the foothills or the coast range. They're quite vulnerable as well. If you have your old issue editions of the Sunset Western Garden Book, you will find they sometimes use a term garden tolerant. Well, they're not tolerant of gardens, they're tolerant of more moist soil conditions. So occasional varieties have been introduced, Yankee Point, which is the blue flower on the left here, uh, that are more tolerant of Phytophthora, basically. They're more resistant to Phytophthora, but in general, some of these California natives are particularly vulnerable. This is an Arctostaphylus, the manzanita. Again, not native on the valley floor. Most of the manzanitas that are installed by landscapers tend to be coastal natives, so they're a little vulnerable already because of the heat and drought stress they'd encounter here in the valley. Quite susceptible to root and crown rot and show a lot of chronic deficiencies, and then the kind of dieback you see in this photograph that I took. I did a consultation once where a landscaper had put in 300 one gallon Arctostaphylus uva ursi, the ground cover species, which is a coastal dune native. And by the time I got there, 290 of them were dead, clearly from Phytophthora. So a poor choice in the valley and a very vulnerable plant to the kind of frequent irrigation that might happen with drip irrigation or with gray water improperly installed. Oaks are a special concern. And I love this picture because this gentleman planted this oak in 1949 in Davis. That's Dr. Milton Hildebrand. That's a cork oak, it's not native. Unfortunately, this particular species of Phytophthora has been decimating the native stands of cork oak where they are in Portugal and other parts of Europe. Um, our own native oak species are also vulnerable. So I did this in bold print so that everybody internalizes this. Mature oaks, whether native or Mediterranean species, should not have irrigation increased around their trunks. When you're looking for the point of outflow, when you're installing a new drip irrigation system, consider the oaks and keep the area all around their trunk free of new irrigation. It has been observed that the same species planted into a landscape can tolerate irrigation, but I'd hate to see someone get a Great gray water system, put the outflow right near the base of a beautiful 80-year-old oak tree like this and have Phytophthora be the consequence. There are native species that are resistant. In California, we have riparian species and some of these exist along Puda Creek and Cache Creek and they can be suitable for rural landscapes. This picture is from my own farm property and that's a Fremont cottonwood that's 15 years old and 50 feet tall. So we don't sell a lot of these or recommend a lot of these for residential settings. Willows are in the same category, but for those of you who might have a rural property, they can be appropriate and they can tolerate a trickle of water every day. That's what they're used to. These live along stream beds and are accustomed to that kind of moisture. They tend to have issues, and so they're not something that I would go to for a, a, you know, a typical backyard, but they may be appropriate for some of those who are listening. And something we've experienced, something we've noticed is that um, Plants from the, great, from the Four Corners region, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Northern Mexico as well, get seasonal monsoon rainfall. I have a friend now who lives in Tucson. They just went through some real storms down there a couple of years ago. They had six inches of rain in just a few days in Tucson, Arizona. That's normal there. And it happens, all, it happens every year when the monsoon air comes north. Many species of salvias from those areas are very suitable for us because they're much more resistant to Phytophthora. Our native species can be vulnerable. And unfortunately, some very, very popular plants from the Mediterranean regions are very susceptible, particularly, just wanna mention lavender, rosemary, and rock rose. Lavender is typically planted on raised beds so the water always percolates away from the crown. And if you were to put in your outflow of either type of gray water system near a lavender plant, it could lead to problems. Now for lower plants, little shrubs, perennials, it would just be an, you know, an experiment, a little failure, you'd just go choose another plant. With the trees, we're quite concerned about it. Australia didn't have Phytophthora cinnamomai until about 100 years ago. It's been in the United States for a couple hundred of years. 
and it is decimating native Australian plants. Uh, good news is they've got some naturalists there making all kinds of observations about which are susceptible and which are resistant. And a good example is the genus Grevillea, which is extremely useful to us here in California for its drought tolerance. A couple of species, overall it's quite susceptible, but a couple of species that I've mentioned here are showing themselves to be quite resistant. Likewise, plants from South Africa, because it has a similar climate, are becoming increasingly popular and important here in California. They can also be vulnerable and we need more information about the species from South Africa and how they'll tolerate watering irrigation here in Sacramento Valley. You can find all kinds of lists about Phytophthora resistance or susceptibility. I just want to mention some of our very common trees like Coast Redwood, Crepe Myrtle are, have good resistance, Ginkgo. Uh, others are quite sensitive, maples, and I also, again, want to emphasize oaks. And I'll throw in red buds because that is a native species that does often show damage from Phytophthora. So the bottom line, when you're installing a gray water system or a drip system for ornamental woody plants, if they are listed or considered drought tolerant, particularly if they're California natives, they should be considered vulnerable to crown rot, which is Phytophthora. If you're a landscaper or you're designing your own landscape, it's useful to research the exceptions. It's confusing. There's a lot of information out there, but there's a lot of different kinds of Phytophthora. So you need to know that you're looking at the right species, Phytophthora cinnamomi. I have compiled a, an ongoing draft database. If any of you are interested, feel free to contact me at my nursery and I can get you a copy of that. It'd be very important if you're putting in a new landscape with drip irrigation, areas with gray water outflow to know which plants could be harmed by the frequent irrigation that might be provided, especially by the daily shower or gray water systems. But follow those best management practices, cite them carefully, and you should be able to avoid problems. Big questions always come up about fruit trees. And there are differences among your fruit trees as to which need more water, which can tolerate less water, and which have very low water requirement. And I would mention that apples and pears and quince, which are not drought tolerant, uh, would probably benefit from having a, a, an extra source of irrigation nearby. And I've gotten some mixed information about their susceptibility, but they seem to be reasonably resistant. The stone fruits and the nut trees and the citrus are intermediate water users. And look at the ones down there that need very low water. I have figs on my property that never get irrigated. They actually go all summer without any supplemental irrigation that that well adapted to the Central Valley. The other question though is how vulnerable are they to crown rot? And uh, citrus is the one that comes up a lot. I've recently diagnosed Phytophthora killing a grapefruit tree that was 40, 50 years old. A couple of years ago, I saw the same thing. The root stock is the issue. Some root stocks, including those that are most commonly used nowadays, are actually pretty resistant. But if you're making a change in your landscape around an older citrus tree and you don't know what the root stock is, be cautious and be aware that there may be a vulnerability to Phytophthora. And of course, avocados, although we don't grow many of them here, are so susceptible to crown rot. There is loads of research on how to manage it in avocado orchards. A quick note about this picture. You see the three-part leaf on this orange. That's a trifoliate orange. If you happen to have that as your rootstock, if maybe a sucker has come up, then you know that your rootstock has pretty good resistance. Stone fruits vary all over the place. Again, it's a, a rootstock issue. The well-known popular semi-dwarf rootstock citation that so many local garden centers sell has good resistance to Phytophthora. Unfortunately, another very popular one, popular for its vigor and uh, tolerance of drought and so on, level is susceptible to crown rot. And most people don't buy their rootstocks on this basis. So it's something you'll just find out kind of hit or miss. Same is true for the nut species. Um, Pears and apples I've mentioned here and uh, not generally considered real susceptible, although apples can be an issue with another species, but generally resistant. This is the good news. Those same ones I mentioned as low water are also generally quite resistant to Phytophthora, persimmons, figs, and pomegranates. And I just threw in passion fruit and loquats for those of you that want to grow something a little more exotic. I should mention that there are some plants that are particularly good at mitigating pollution and tolerate very poor quality water. The grasses and reeds and sedges can take daily watering. So if you happen to have a part of your landscape that has what we call turf or ornamental grasses, that can be one area perhaps for the outflow. And it will also mitigate some of the, uh, the issues with what might be in that water. Bamboo uh, is especially adaptable because bamboo for the most part come from regions with monsoon rainfall cycles where they are inundated with water for weeks at a time and then long periods of drought as well. Now, I know that bamboo has a wrap for being quite invasive, but as the editor of the 
the magazine of the American Bamboo Society, I can tell you there are hundreds of species and varieties available in the trade and many of them are not invasive at all. But be aware that many grasses, including bamboo, have roots that are fairly aggressive and could possibly plug the outflow of your gray water system or your drip system emitters. Barriers may be appropriate if you're installing bamboo as part of your landscape with a gray water or a regular drip irrigation system. Just plant the right ones if you're gonna do bamboo, the clumpers like bambusas, not the runners like phyllostachys. So I'm gonna leave it there and open up to any questions. And um, that's, my, that's my presentation. Thank you, Don. And uh, we'll go to Frances now if she has some questions for Don. Yes, thank you so much, Don. That was fascinating. We have a number of questions. I'm just gonna pull out two that seem very particularly um, uh, related to your presentation and the rest of them, those of you who asked the other ones will keep to the end when we have more time. So Lynn asked, is gray water okay for mesquite trees? I am in Arizona solar zone eight. I will have to check whether mesquite are susceptible to Phytophthora, but based on where they are and uh, the fact that monsoon rains are, are typical and they're accustomed to high temperature and high moisture happening at the same time, I'm gonna guess, my educated guess will be mesquite will be fine. How's that? <laughs> Super, thank you. I was kind of thinking the same thing too, based on what you had said. Um, Martha asks, is monthly deep watering okay near a manzanita or orange? Monthly would be fine because the surface will have a chance to dry out. You wanna avoid the, the frequency of irrigation, which allows those motile spores to move from root to root, stem to stem. Uh, but if you went a full month between irrigations of well-established citrus, which is a reasonable way to go, uh, and we happen to be watering your manzanita once a month, I think you would be safe because Phytophthora would simply be unable to get a foothold in that situation. You want to be careful not to ever change the grade around the plant, increasing soil level around the stem. Certainly don't suddenly increase the irrigation frequency. Once a month though, that gets to that best management practice of allowing the surface to dry out between irrigations. Super, thank you so much, Don. And that's all the questions we'll do for right now. Okay, great. Thank you, Francis, and thank you, Don. I do also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Chrissy Backman, who is doing an amazing job with the tech side of this webinar, and she doesn't get to come on camera, um, and keeping it running sp smoothly. So thank you very much, Chrissy. Um, our next speaker is Leslie Krenna. She's not only this next speaker, but she is also the person who put this on and got this together. Um, 